The ideal gas law is the subject of this next um, section. First a demo. This is a beaker full of a little bit of liquid nitrogen. I have a helium balloon here and it's not floating because it doesn't have much helium in it and the weight of the balloon is pulling it down. I'm also going to uh, fill a balloon with my own breath. And then I'm going to dip the balloon in the liquid nitrogen and ask what happens to it. Shrinking. Why? Because it's cooling the, the air in the interior of the balloon. And in fact, it's kind of crackling and becoming So what happens to helium? Oh, that was with, with air. This is with helium. It started off a little bit bigger. We're actually running a little low on liquid nitrogen there. Basically, just to show that uh, through the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. If the temperature is lowered inside of a balloon, the, either the pressure has to go down or the volume has to go down. Since we've got atmospheric pressure acting on the outside, it's, uh, the, the pressure inside and outside has to be about both have to be atmospheric pressure, then the volume has to decrease. Okay, um, good introduction to the um, ideal gas law. In fact, we've stated it already in the, in the demo video. The ideal gas is an idealized model for real gases that have low densities. So when you're cramming a, you have a really, really high density gas, it doesn't work very well. And the idea is that the molecules are so far apart that they don't interact except when they collide with each other. And the assumption is that those collisions are elastic collisions. We talked several chapters ago about elastic versus inelastic. A totally inelastic collision is one where they stick together after the collision. An elastic collision is one in which the kinetic energy is conserved. So they bounce off of each other, hard, uh, like, a, like a ball that bounces really, really well and comes off the floor and comes back up, at least very close to where it started. So, um, so the pressure is going to be proportional to the temperature if the volume is held constant. That's not the example that we talked about before. Uh, if you hold the volume constant, so instead of a balloon, you've got a nice solid um, box, and you increase the temperature of the box, the pressure is going to go up. And the reason is the, the gas molecules are, are moving around at higher rates of speed and pushing on the walls of the container more strongly. So that's what happens when um, the, the volume is constant. We'll say more about that later. The pressure goes up as the temperature goes up. This is absolute pressure, by the way, not gauge pressure. So what about constant temperature? The pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. So here's an example of that case. Um, I've got a, a balloon. Uh, it's held by the hand, and, and the hand is pinching off the balloon so no air is coming in or 
are, are coming out of the balloon. And then you, you pull the balloon down through the hand, and what you're doing is you're going to decrease the volume and increase the pressure. So here we decrease the volume by cinching my hand up against the balloon uh, and increasing the pressure inside of the balloon. So they have an inversely proportional relationship. Um, so initially, this would be the initial situation here where the volume is high and the pressure is low. And then as we decrease the volume by cinching your hand up against it, the, the volume is going to go down, but the pressure is going to go up. So also the pressure is proportional to the amount of gas. Um, so the more gas you have inside of a container, the more those molecules are going to bounce against the walls of the container and create pressure. So to, to codify this relationship, um, it, it's called the ideal gas law. It holds very, very well. Uh, for most gases at room temperature, it does a great job. And it's PV equals NRT. You might have seen it before. Pressure is measured in pascals, which is newtons per square meter, like we talked about in previous chapters. The volume of the gas is just length times width times height, or uh, the spherical volume. It's just the volume measured in meters cubed. Um, number of moles, um, which is the total number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number, like we talked about earlier um, today. And then the gas constant. This is the new piece. It's 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. The, the temperature has to be measured in, in Kelvin uh, for the ideal gas law to work. This does not work for uh, temperature measured in Celsius or in Fahrenheit. Works for the Kelvin temperature. This is one. This law is, in fact, one of the good reasons why uh, defining the Kelvin temperature is important. The gas constant. Let's just double check the units. This is joules per mole Kelvin, and that appears right here. Joules per mole Kelvin. Well, the per mole here gets canceled out by the number of moles here. The per Kelvin here gets canceled out by the temperature T measured in Kelvin. So we end up just with joules on the right-hand side of this equation. Let's see what units uh, the left-hand side of the equation have. P is pascals. That's newtons per square meter. Remember, because pressure is force per unit area, force in newtons, area in square meters, times the volume measured in meters cubed. Well, then two of these three masses or meters get canceled by the ones in the denominator, and we end up with Newton meters. Well, that's just joules. So we've got joules on the left side, joules on the right side. The units work out. I, I once asked um, on a test for the students to state the ideal gas law, which is I was hoping for this. This is the answer that I got, um, which did not get any credit. I wanted to give them credit, but I didn't give them any. The ideal gas law is that someday gas prices will be low enough that we can all afford to drive. So we're now going to rewrite the ideal gas law in terms of the total number of particles. This is more the physicist's way of writing the ideal gas law. The, the way that we wrote it down, PV equals NRT, uh, is, the, is the way that normally chemists will use. So the, the trick here is that we want to rewrite it in terms of the total number of particles instead of the number of moles. That's the only difference. And to do that, <coughs> the trick is to multiply and divide the right side of this equation by Na, by the Avogadro's number. Here's where I multiplied the right side by Na. And here's where I divided the right side by Na. Now clearly, I can just cancel these back out again, and we get NRT on the right side. So I haven't changed the right side. But multiplying and dividing by Na allows us to do the following. Remember that N is N 
big N over NA. If you plug that in here, then you'll have N is big N over NA times NA, and the NAs cancel, and you just get big N out of the deal. So I have succeeded in rewriting it in terms of the total number of particles. That's N, total number of particles. But then what's the, the stuff that's left over? I've got R divided by NA here. R is the gas constant, 8.31 um, joule per mole Kelvin, divided by NA, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. That gives us a new constant, uh, which we call K. It's called Boltzmann's constant, and it proves to be one of the most important constants in all of physics. This is the only time, well, we'll talk about it a little bit in this chapter and, and, and in chapter uh, 15 this semester, but next semester when we talk about quantum mechanics, Boltzmann's constant will come up again. It's very important in understanding our quantum world, and it's the, the tie that we have to the quantum, the world of the very, very small. And speaking of very small, it's a small number. <laughs> it's really small. It's R, which is 8.31, right? 0.31 joule per mole Kelvin uh, times Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. So notice when you divide this number by this number, the per moles are going to cancel. The particle isn't really a unit, and you end up with just joules um, per Kelvin. So that's the unit here, and the exponent here is 10 to the minus 23rd. Um, as big as the Avogadro's number is, when you divide by Avogadro's number, you're going to get a very small number, and that's Boltzmann's constant. So you can rewrite the ideal gas law as PV equals NKT with a capital N uh, as opposed to NRT with a little n. Okay, an example in the lungs, the respiratory membrane separates tiny sacs of air from the blood in the capillaries. And the pressure is roughly uh, atmospheric pressure. So here's a little sac of air. Um, these sacs are called avioli. The average radius of these is 0.125 millimeters. And the air inside contains 14% oxygen. So, assuming that the air behaves as an ideal gas, at uh, 310 degrees Kelvin, roughly the temperature of the human body, find the number of oxygen molecules in one of these sacs. So for this one, we're interested not in the number of moles, but in the number of particles. So we use the PV equals NKT with a capital N. Divide both sides of that equation by KT to find N, giving this equation here, PV over KT. Pressure is absolute pressure. Remember, you need absolute pressure, not gauge pressure, for the ideal gas law. Then we need the volume of a sphere of radius 0.125 millimeters. Well, that's four-thirds, the volume of a sphere is four-thirds pi r cubed. Four pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. This 4 thirds pi r cubed is the um, volume. All right, that's 4 thirds pi, and here's the radius cubed, divided by Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd, times 310 Kelvin. So we get about uh, 10 to the 14 molecules. Uh, then the question actually asks how much uh, of that is oxygen, given that only 14% of the air is inside there is oxygen. So we just multiply by four, uh, 0.14 to get the number of molecules of oxygen.
All right, uh, derived relationships, there'll be a few problems that you, you, know, you can use to, to test your skills on these. Um, derive the relationships between the pressures, volumes, and temperatures for processes carried out at constant pressure. Um, these are called uh, constant pressure uh, processes, is sometimes called an isobaric or isobaric process. Um, at constant volume, if you're carrying it out at constant volume, it's isovolumetric. And a process that's carried out at constant temperature is called an isothermal. So in fact, the um, The demonstration that we did by taking those balloons and putting them in liquid nitrogen and watching their volumes shrink uh, was approximately uh, an isobaric process, a constant pressure. The atmosphere, uh, assuming that the balloon it, material itself didn't exert a significant pressure on the interior, um, and that the interior and the exterior of the balloons were roughly at atmospheric pressure, then what we were changing was the temperature and the volume. As the temperature went down, the volume went down. And, and this is a uh, constant pressure um, process. And uh, the equation that we have that describes that is this one right here. So let me describe what we're doing here. PV equals nRT. We use the chemist's version. Um, so if you put the T over here, you'll have NR here and PV here. So that's obviously the ideal gas law just rewritten. If you assume, and, and with all of these processes, we're going to assume that the total number of um, particles is not changing. The number of moles is not changing. R is the gas constant. It's not going to change either. So. G both of these guys are, are going to stay the same. The initial and the final are going to stay the same. So we can, all we have to do is to set um, PV over T at the initial situation equal to PV over T for the final situation. So think of it as, uh, in the case of the demo, the original pressure, uh, atmospheric, the original temperature, um, room temperature, the original volume, those would be P, I, V, I, and, and T, I. And then the final would be after the balloon has shrunk down. So if the pressure is constant in this process, then the initial pressure equals the final pressure. And they can, they'll cancel each other out, and you get this equation. And this equation does, in fact, say that if you lower the temperature, then you're going, to you're going to have to lower the volume. The temperature goes down, the volume will go down. So here's my big volume and my big initial temperature of the balloon sitting at uh, room temperature. And here's my final volume of the balloon, which had shrunk down, and the temperature is much smaller. Um, so if, this, if the volume was down, the temperature has to go down, too. Volume goes up, the temperature has to go up. So that's a process for constant P. Uh, constant V and I isovolumetric process. So for constant P, we just simply say that PI equals PF, right? And we've canceled out the PI and the PF. For constant volume, we just simply say that VI, the initial volume, equals VF. And so we go back to the same equation, but in this case, the VI and the VF are equal to each other, and we cancel them out. So we get just PI over TI equals PF over TF. That's how we get this one. Then a process, and I think you're getting the idea here, a process carried out at constant temperature, then TI equals TF. And these guys cancel, and we just end up with PV initial equals PV final. I'm going to give you a chance to practice some of those.